once again you have given us a you have given us a platform that I will be able to share uh, what pertains the uh, smooth running of our country Malawi, and we pray that God, even as we we interface with the uh, Minister of Finance tonight, we pray that you give us wisdom, you give us direction, be with Him and be with us all until we see that what we're doing is pleasing unto you and to our nation and flourishing of our own lives and, and families to your name's glory. We thank you for our leaders and those that are hosting us tonight and those that are going to be joining. We pray for the calm spirit and understanding and forbearance to the glory of your name. We pray this so in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So welcome again. Just a reminder of the rules. Please make sure that your microphones are muted um, at all times. Please, please, please make sure of that. Um, we've got so many people joining us today um, from all corners of the world. And you can bet that there are going to be a lot of questions. There's going to be a lot of debate. And we need to give ample time to the minister to speak to us and to the questions. So please, please, please keep your microphones muted. Um, put as many questions as you can in the chat. Um, for now, I would like to invite my co-host, Dr. Lloyd Mahoe, in case he has a word or two to launch us off. Yeah, Over thank you so you. much. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Msusa. Uh, just to concur with her that uh, we've got limited time with the minister and uh, the intention is that to make the most from him. So yeah, unlike what we did in the last session that we had with uh, the Minister of Lands, we will do it slightly differently today with a view of um, maximizing on the time. <clears throat> so on uh, questions, the appeal is that um, you put your questions in the chat and uh, we will try to communicate as many questions that come in the chat there to the minister and uh, you attend to them. Um, yeah, it's an opportunity again that we have a very senior minister back home to speak to us and uh, let's make the most of it. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Brother Lloyd. Um, at this point in time, I'd like to call upon the um, chairperson of the Malawi Congress Party Diaspora Network, um, Charles Ongula, to give us a word or two and to introduce the guest of honor. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sousa, the minister has not joined yet. So um, if you give me a minute or two uh, to let the minister join in first, then um, I can come in. All right. OK. OK. Um, so what do we talk about whilst we're waiting for the, for the minister? Um, the, these sessions, um, last week, people were asking what the purpose of this session is. So these sessions are to arm ourselves with the information that we need in order to be able to participate fully um, in the running of our nation. So as diaspora, we believe that we've got so much that we can offer to our country, um, but it needs to be channeled appropriately. It needs to be meaty enough um, to make a difference. And it needs to be well received by the other side, by the homeland. So um, these sessions um, contribute to that process by arming us with the knowledge that we require to be able to fulfill this mission that we have. So um, we try to make them as nonpartisan as possible. MCPDN is the one facilitating these meetings but they are open to every Malawian, especially Malawians living out in the diaspora. Um, if you have any other questions regarding these sessions, why we have them and what the purpose is, you are always welcome to direct them to us. As we go along, we're going to put the email addresses and all other information in the chat and also the speakers will share them with you so that if you have questions, if you have concerns, you can always reach out and let us know. Um, Lloyd, any other information that we can give them? 
Yeah, just, just to concur again with uh, what you've just said that, uh, yes, much as uh, these forums are hosted by NCPDN, which is uh, the diaspora network of um, the Malawi Congress Party, but the intention is that um, the wider Malawian community out here should be able to engage with uh, the authorities back home. I'm sure most of us know of countries that have benefited a lot from um, their communities outside their countries. Ethiopia being a good example of um, what their diaspora populations can do back home. Philippines is another country that has gained a lot out of that. And uh, many other countries have actually came up, have actually come up with uh, structures that are used for the communities out there to help in um, the development of the, their countries countries back home. So we are also looking at maybe getting to that, uh, but uh, we can only do that if we have platforms where we engage, where our authorities can come and speak to us, and where we are able to know what is happening on the ground. So yeah, this forum is largely aimed at achieving that, and uh, everybody is welcome. But as mm. the host, um, being MCPDN, yeah, we'll share our contacts here. You can reach out to us on any queries that you may have. So looking forward to a wonderful session once again. Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. is the minister with us now? Yes, yes, he's here now. Great, then uh, we pass on to the chair to introduce the minister and then, uh, yeah, we pick it up from there. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Are you on mute? Oh, thanks very much, Mr. Mahoe. And thanks, uh, thanks very much to everybody else that has joined this meeting today. It's such an honor that uh, all of you have been able to join in and that we have a good discussion about our country, Malawi. Yes, the Minister of Finance and Economic Planning is with us and he will be here to answer our questions. As the moderators have said, try to put your questions in the charts and they will read it out to the minister so that he can answer the questions. Um, let me also thank the minister himself for making himself available to us, the diaspora. We always look for a time like this and it's such an honor that he has, amidst his busy schedules, he's made himself available to speak to us today. Uh, let me also acknowledge the presence of um, the high commissioner uh, of Malawi in London, in UK, Dr. Thomas Bisika, who is also with us, together with uh, Dua Kandoje, also from the Malawi Embassy in London. Um, Honorable Gwengwe needs no introduction. He is a member of parliament for Ilongwe and Sozi North. Um, when Dr. Lazarus Chakwila came in power, he became the Minister of Trade. And uh, during that time, we saw him facilitating the signing of the memorandum of understanding in terms of trade with South Sudan for Malawi to export maize, ground nuts, beans to Sudan. And also we saw him facilitating the deal with um, the Egyptian electric company, the 816 billion Malawi Kwacha deal. Um, on the recent reshuffle that President Chakwera did, uh, Onamu Gwengwe, was given the post of uh, Minister of Finance and Economic Planning. And um, he has just uh, delivered his first budget, the 2.84 trillion kwacha budget, which has been de described as the people-centered budget. So um, let me take this opportunity to welcome the Honorable Minister to the Diaspora Malawians. Welcome, Honorable Gwengwe. Thank you. Thank you. You want me to take it from there? <laughs> yes, Onambo. Uh, right. If you want to address the gathering first before we go into questions and answers or anything else that you want to say before we open the floor for the people to start asking you questions. Uh, I, I think maybe, uh, Chairperson, um, just to thank you and uh, the whole diaspora network uh, for um, having me this evening. Um, it's, not, it's something I do not take for granted. Uh, I know that um, most of us uh, in this chat are young people and uh, we are very passionate about our country. 
and we would want to contribute meaningfully to something that can turn our country around. And I think um, I speak for all of us, maybe in this conversation this evening, that at the place where our country is, nobody can claim the monopoly of wisdom. I, I believe that um, each and every one of us does have something which if properly channeled into the formal system can help uh, build our country, can help fix our economy. Because those of us that have followed the way Malawi's economy has performed for the past decade or two decades can agree with me that the picture we are seeing today is gloomy. Actually is more precarious than uh, the one we used to see uh, some 10 years, speaking for myself, when I first joined uh, politics in 2009. And um, my belief is that if there's anything that needs to be done to turn the corner, I think now is the time to do that. And the only way to do that, speaking for myself, is that uh, perhaps we talk more of things that make professional sense and talk less of things that make political sense. Because if we are in this situation, maybe it's because those that have the know-how, those that have the experience, those that have the knowledge have tended to cloud it out with politics. And in the end, we've made decisions as a country that are populist rather than realistic. And between good politics and good economics lies a cream of young Malawians who would be able to walk that thin line that differentiates politics and proper economics and start suggesting things that if put into action can start rescuing or reversing uh, the trends that the country has uh, been experiencing. I would give you a snapshot of uh, where we are as a, as a country. I wish I had uh, that aspect properly written down, but um, the situation, the, the revenues that we are correcting uh, and uh, this time around, we are projecting that MRA should give us about 1.6 trillion Malawi kwacha. If you compare what we are correcting with uh, what they normally call statutory expenditures, or, or other people would call them in simplistic terms, legal mandatory expenditures, the ones that uh, whether you have money or you do not have money as a government, you must pay. These are non-negotiable and not even parliament can reduce these appropriations. That's money that goes to salaries and wages, and it's pegged at 670 billion Malawi kwacha in this budget. You also have a void which is public debt. So the amounts that government owes people locally or abroad, as long as it's public debt, you cannot default as a government and that obligation, whether parliament wants or not, must be complied to. And that's in the ranges of 523 billion Malawi kwacha, thereabout. Then you've got people's gratuities and pensions. And that again is also a statutory expenditure. In short, when you add the statutory expenditures, the amount is coming up to about 1.3 trillion Malawi kwacha. Now, that's the situation where we are as a country where um, from what we are collecting, leaving grants out, but what we are collecting and what we need to spend as a statutory expenditure, the difference is just about 300, 400 billion plus minus. Now from that port, that's where now you need to start appropriating to everything else whether you want roads or whether you want medicines or whether you want fuel or whether you want anything which you now need to appropriate 
needs to come from that Miagra 300, 400 billion. So what do you do? You need to borrow because uh, things must go on, life must go on, Malawians must live and be able to go to school and be able to have uh, NIF and uh, AIP and roads and everything. So we, we tend to beef up that uh, resource envelope with uh, borrowing. And I remember me uh, speaking for my first time in parliament as a spokesperson of a political party in 2009, I think it was 8th July. I was responding to a budget that was presented then. But when we look at uh, the amounts that were being put forward as deficit, the amounts were small. And since 2009 up to today, when I was presenting my own budget, the deficit line is now at 800 plus billion. If this, if this trend is not reversed, then we'll have a situation where as a country we'll be borrowing like half half. And then a situation would come where we we'll now need to live on borrowed money because uh, what we are collecting is not even enough to meet the statutory expenditures. I'm talking of people's salaries and I'm talking of pensions, I'm talking of uh, public debts. So at a situation where we are, we need to take drastic actions, but most importantly, speaking for myself, I think all of us will need to have collective responsibility and play a part in turning the corner. Because when you look at this mountain, I do not think anybody has the monopoly of wisdom to be able to do this alone. So a Minister of Finance would suggest some austerity measures, would suggest some other ways to enhance our revenue collection, and would, enhance, would bring in some measures to, 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 to seal some loopholes and some, the, the, maybe some leakages. But you need buy-in because in the end, there's not a single person who would be able to single-handedly drive the change that Malawi needs to drive the corner. And I think that's where the diaspora also need to think outside the box and say, what role can I play? Because the problem is enormous. Is there a way that I can channel my views into the formal system? Because at this juncture, nobody knows where the wisdom is going to come from. And I'm really happy this evening to engage fellow young people this evening and just participate, borrow some wisdom, share some constructive ideas, because in the end, we have a country to rebuild and we have an economy to fix. And that will call for all of us to take our civic duty for the benefit, not of only of us, but for the benefit of our children and grandchildren. So Chairperson, let me leave it there for now. But once again, I am honored to be part and parcel of this conversation tonight. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Honorable Minister. And I'll leave it to the moderators uh, to carry on. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Honorable Minister, for an honest view of uh, where we stand as a country. And uh, I think that lays a very solid base for this discussion here. And uh, yeah, your appeal to us for contributions and wisdom is uh, much welcome. And I'm sure it's the desire of uh, each one of us here to make sure that uh, we do contribute to our country back home in uh, whatever manner we can. And wisdom is uh, one key area that can be tapped from this forum here. <laughs> Um, yeah, as we said, um, this forum will largely be driven by the questions that will be coming from the, uh, the participants here. And um, for those that have just joined us, um, our appeal is that um, those questions be written uh, in a chat and um, the moderators will be picking them up from the chat there and put them across to the minister. 
But um, yeah, I will start, uh, Honorable Minister, with a question that came um, before the meeting here. There are some questions that uh, had come earlier from um, the members as well. And uh, it touched on um, the same topic that you talked about here, about borrowing, which is um, quite a key concern. Uh, we've seen countries that have ended up going bankrupt simply because uh, they've borrowed beyond the, their capacity to, uh, to pay back. So uh, the question is that uh, to seek from you uh, how you project this borrowing status in the short to medium term and uh, how that is going to impact our, our economy in, uh, in the long term. And again, you've talked about how critical uh, we are as, um, as of now and uh, possibly I'm sure as you said, you could be having some uh, key action points that uh, the ministry is um, looking at. Is there any that you can share on um, what your top priorities are to address this thing? So to forward where the borrowing will take us to in uh, the short to medium term and uh, the action plans that you have to address that. Yeah, th thanks Lloyd. Um, I think uh, first and foremost, um, we, we, we do have the uh, the short term or pretty much the immediate measures that uh, we are undertaking. But we also have uh, the medium to longer term, uh, uh, more strategic uh, measures that we also are taking. So to start with, um, when we were coming up with the budget framework, which is like uh, the one page or two page maximum um, uh, snapshot of how you would want your budget to look like. So you do have your projected revenues and grants, and you also do have your projected expenditure. And that gives you some net lending, uh, some, some deficit line, how much you need to borrow, whether externally or locally. Now, um, we, the previous financial year was a nine months financial year. And uh, this one is now a 12 months financial year. When we compare, or when you, when, when you, compare, when you fiscalize the nine months to a 12 months fiscal year, and then you compare, the, this year and last year, what you will notice is that uh, the, the deficit line as a percentage of GDP has declined by about one percentage point from eight point something percent of GDP last financial year to seven point something percent of GDP this financial year. And going forward, we would want to be reducing this net lending by a percentage point of the GDP every year. Why is that important? Because that's the line that determines how much you're going to borrow. And most of the borrowing is the expensive domestic borrowing, where government has to patch up here and there because maybe we are falling short of collections from uh, MRA or other, other measures. So first, and uh, the immediate measure is to be able to control that line. And that now means that we need to control extra budgetary spending and the MDAs need to live within those constraints because the budget performance should not go beyond what parliament will appropriate in the next few weeks. That is the immediate thing that uh, we're doing. And that goes with uh, the other people will call them austerity, but uh, we'll call them cost cutting measures where you would want to reduce uh, uh, your expenditure in a way that it doesn't really affect too much of say, public service delivery. But also at the same time, we're looking at measures that can boost the revenue line so that we can collect a little bit more. And we've got the domestic revenue mobilization strategy, which has outlined a few changes, how MRA is going to be working from this financial year. And all that is aimed at creating some space so that we are within that deficit uh, bracket of 7.7% of GDP and not go beyond that one. The, the, the other thing which we're doing in the immediate or in the immediate term is to be able to look at, to look at our debt portfolio. And it's alarming because it's sitting at close to 5.8 trillion Malawi kwacha. And uh, what we're doing now is to look at uh, the debt portfolio because the risk is debt sustainability. The risk is, are we going to service these debts as they fall due? Now, I'll give you a scenario of Zambia where their 
debt to GDP ratio is about 117% of their, of their GDP. So Zambia has, as a percentage of GDP, has almost twice the levels of debt uh, with Malawi. Ours is about 56, 57% of GDP. But the issue of debt sustainability comes in with the question, are you going to be able to honor your debts as they fall due? So you now need to be able to look at where will the dollars be coming from? Because we might have the quachas, but most of these dollars must be paid, I mean, debts must be paid in dollars. So we need to be able to look at our exports and that's where issues of balance of payments come, come in. Uh, our exports performing. But you also need to be able to look at are the inflows, say from the diaspora, are they coming in as uh, in the, into the country? But you also need to be able to look at the grants and other project uh, money that comes with donors. So all that put into context, you need to be able to balance and see those kind of inflows. So in the immediate term, we're looking at the situation and say some of the expensive loans that are falling due sooner, we need to be able to restructure some of them. And we've, uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, debt restructuring in the meantime, so that we give ourselves some breathing space as we organize the house uh, going forward. And lastly, in the longer term, it's all about exports. So we've isolated four mines, three or four mines that I uh, would want to uh, concentrate very much on because we know that uh, in this fiscal year, latest by next financial year, those mines should start performing and giving us the much needed dollars and give, giving us the much needed export diversification. So there's the rare F in Palombe, there's Kanyika, the Nobiam, and then there is uh, the, um, the, the Kairekera, uh, which, has been which has been recommissioned. And then there's also another one in um, Kasia and Maringunde. So we, we're prioritizing four mines, which will beef up our exports from the agricultural uh, products, uh, and, then, uh, and then see how our debt sustainability in the context of increased exports will start looking like, so that is, this issue of debt sustainability uh, uh, is properly handled. So in, 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 the, in the short term, those are some of the measures. I know it's uh, a mouthful and there's a lot more, but in the interest of, of time, I think uh, that's the kind of direction we're taking as far as uh, handling our national debt is concerned. Yeah, quite alarming indeed. And uh, yeah, interesting to hear. Uh, you've touched on Forex, which is um, where my next two questions are coming from, uh, from uh, the chat here, from the, which the members have put in. One was asking, of course, uh, on uh, Forex, which um, appears to be a real barrier to economic activity it is back home and people cannot trade and if they don't trade then you want to be having the avenues to collect tax so the question was what are we doing to alleviate the lack of forex and then um, yeah, somebody else is coming in again with uh, which could be a solution he's asking as to why we've not focused so much on uh, uh, exporting uh, the food products and um, uh, he's talking in terms of uh, the middle east that is uh, always uh, importing food that starts from uh, so many areas why malawi has not jumped on uh, that opportunity to export as much food as um, we can so two questions that um, you can tackle jointly which should um, touch on um, the forex situation that you talked about so i think the the short and long of uh, that question is uh, Malawi, I think, is doing quite a lot in terms of finding uh, markets for the agricultural products. Um, the Sudani deal is going on, and um, uh, quite a lot of commodities are tracking that side. But um, we have also seen that our soya bean has also been. Uh, um, uh, contributing significantly to our exports. Uh, last season, we had some substantial some um, uh, exports of uh, soya bean. And um, the tobacco is also performing, except that uh, with the contract farming these days, um, the, 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 the forex doesn't come as much as it used to come uh, uh, previously uh, for some other reasons. But uh, I, I would say that Malawi is uh, making strides in uh, increasing the agricultural uh, exports, not just uh, 
the raw commodity, but also the value added. Um, the soya pieces, if you go to Zambia, you see that there's a lot of soya pieces coming from Malawi as well. So um, yes, we need to do more, but from my own observation, in terms of uh, the export performance and what we produce um, uh, has been performing. If you produced more, like for example, last year, the demand for soya bean in China was maybe 10 times what we produce as a country. And people had to be importing maybe from Zambia into Malawi and then the export to China and other uh, destinations. So um, it's all linked to agricultural productivity and then also being able to value add and then say, uh, uh, export these uh, uh, high value agricultural products. But beyond the agricultural products, we also need to be able to look at, we're sitting on quite a lot of mineral wealth. How can we accelerate uh, the exports of our minerals so that we, we, we start making some money uh, out of our own minerals? Um, people have talked of virtual assets, and that's an idea which we can borrow from whosoever is an expert or at least knows some of these things where I'm told you are able to, to, to trade your own minerals in some stock exchanges, say in Hong Kong, as a virtual asset, where you would say, this is our gold, and um, these are the papers, these are the quantities, these are the values, front load us some, some dollars, you keep it, and then they will be trading that, make profit out of it, and then revert it back to the country after some time. So we're sitting on uh, a lot of minerals, uh, can we have creative ways of making money out of it? I think that's a discussion that Malawians need to be having. But in the in the in the in in the the the, the silver bullet in us being able to unlock some of these uh, dollar resources constraints, I would say, is uh, us prioritizing getting back on a program with the IMF. For me, that's a priority. And uh, that's what uh, I think um, should really unlock quite a lot of resources, the way the IMF works. Um, what they give us as ECF may not be much, but the impact of the program is huge. And uh, the ministry is, is, um, is taking these talks now more aggressively. And my hope is uh, that uh, we should really be able to um, get on a program sooner or later uh, because that would help uh, a lot as far as inflows uh, of dollars are concerned. Thank you so much. And uh, I like the way you are throwing out some opportunities to us as uh, you answer the questions. Yeah, so we are taking note of uh, the things that you are doing at your end and um, where we feel like we see opportunities that we can step in. I'm sure members are picking that up and uh, we should be able to engage. Uh, I will combine my next two questions again before I hand over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Msusa. As two people have raised um, the points on uh, the, the budgeting process and uh, somebody was querying that uh, when we see things like say Mombera project or Nika Road, which keep coming in each and every successive budget that we see, but then uh, the year ends, nothing is on, uh, on the ground there. What happens in those cases? Uh, does it imply that um, money was used, but um, not on the intended purpose? And then uh, that drives into the next question, which is about um, the auditing processes. People want to know uh, when maybe the government would be making the audit reports for institutions that are under the government open and um, to the public so that they can look at them and know which are, what each and every institution is doing with, uh, with their taxes. So two things, things that are budgeted and not executed, and then uh, the auditing process for government institutions. Uh, thank you, Lloyd. Um, so to avoid it looking like I'm defending a PhD uh, thesis, there are, there are some people in the, in the forum. I, I, I've, I've seen Professor Martin Intambo, I think sitting with you there in, uh, in the US. These are, these are accomplished uh, accountants and finance people lecturing in the universities in America. I think uh, we should be able to also uh, give people some chance to be able to chip in on their experiences as well, because um, I would not benefit much if uh, I, 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 I talk throughout, 
because what I'll be speaking is what I already know. <laughs> and in the end, uh, it may not really uh, uh, benefit me uh, uh, more if people don't really uh, also chip in on what they think uh, 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 should be uh, happening. Maybe there'll be time uh, as, we, as we go towards the end, but I wanted to flag uh, that aspect, uh, uh, Lloyd and um, yeah. Madam Sousa. On the budget processes, the, the money that uh, goes into the, the, the budget is um, money for the MDAs. So the, the Ministry of Finance will go through a process which they call agreeing the stealings with the MDAs. So they would go on to uh, a, a, or an MDA would say, well, the Ministry of Transport, uh, these are our activities, these are our strategic issues, this is where we want to be, and then they will agree ceilings with uh, those MDAs. Once the ceilings are agree agreed, then we come up with uh, the balancing act in the books, and then we come up with uh, estimates. And these are the books that are taken to parliament as estimates. Um, and um, once parliament approves those estimates, then we say the budget has passed, but the budget cannot start working until there's an appropriation act where now parliament has powers to appropriate the money to various MDAs. After the appropriation is done, then the budget director sitting at the Minister of Finance must start funding those MDAs. So MDAs will be funded and at the Accountant General's office, they will know their daily funding or monthly funding that these votes or MDAs have been funded from the budget director. So the, 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 the Accountant General would now be releasing those funds to the MDAs. And they'll be releasing those funds using IFMIS. And then the IFMIS sitting here at the Minister of Finance at the Accountant General's office, they'll be using a system that conveys all that to RBM. RBM has got their own system, which receives all this. I think they call it the flex tube. And once all that's processed, it goes on into the ATS, which is now linked with the commercial banks. And then the money goes into the accounts of the MDAs. So it's possible to fund an MDA and then go through this process of the actual disbursement of uh, the resources. So you agree ceilings, you approve estimates, you appropriate in parliament, you fund MDAs, then you disburse using a system that links the accountant general, the reserve bank, and the commercial bank. So I would say that's the whole uh, process uh, on how monies move uh, between the account number one and uh, the, the, the MDAs. Talking about the audit reports, uh, the Public Finance Management Act of 2003, and also the 2022 one, which uh, we are hoping can be uh, tabled and passed in this sitting, uh, requires the, sta the state-owned enterprises, even the statutory corporations, to the Minister of Finance to lay these financial statements, audited financial statements in parliament. So that, uh, and I was saying in my statement that I would want to extend it a little bit more by asking the speaker to allow for some debate of these financial statements, because previously you just lay them and people would read them at their own time in the National Assembly Library. But we would want to be given a little bit of time that people can discuss the performance of these SOEs, because um, when we were growing up as young people and our parents were working for ADMAC or working for all these parastatals as MD or CEO, and everybody would say this is prestigious and these, these guys are really doing good. But today the MDAs, so the, the parastatals, the SOEs have actually become an ISO and would want to bring back that accountability through parliament. The moment you lay these audited accounts in parliament, then you know they're public documents and the people can scrutinize them and assess the performance of the management that we have. 
in these institutions. Because if they start working as a business, then government should be getting dividend and government should, should not really be, um, um, be on the receiving end of bailouts and, and all these things. So yes, the law already requires that uh, the audited financial accounts be laid in parliament. It's an activity that I'm already undertaking and there's a team, actually a department within the ministry that's looking at this one and the CEOs, uh, most of the CEOs have been communicated and uh, will be seeing this uh, in parliament from this financial year. Okay, thank you, Honorable. Um, it falls to me to ask the question that is the big elephant in the room. <laughs> what Go is on. wrong with IFMIS? Okay, okay, so there are four questions that I'll try and combine them because they are short. The first one is what is wrong with IFMIS? Second one, what measures have been put in place to mitigate funding for crucial organs of the government, such as ACB? Um, third one, does the ministry work with the presidential delivery unit to clear financing issues? For example, funding for the ACB. And then the last one that concerns us, the diaspora, what is the government position on receiving donations from the diaspora? from individuals or from groups or from foreign governments to help fund critical government factions like the ACB. Um, other ministries like Ministry of Health, they accept funding and help from Scotland, from the UK. What about the ACB? Would it be a welcome thing to do? Over to you, Honorable. Yeah, I think um, I would give you an answer on if miss and you'd all go like, no, that's not true. Because uh, my, uh, my response on IFMIS is, there's uh, nothing wrong with IFMIS. <laughs> but <laughs> I know that <laughs> somebody will say that's not really true. So the, the IFMIS is a new, is a new um, um, integrated uh, program um, that processes all these funding uh, issues. But beyond funding issues, the IFMIS also processes some reports for management use. So um, it produces quite a lot of uh, uh, reports on how the, the government money is being used and, and, on, and, and all that. So looking at IFMIS as a system, it's a very good system. It's a very new system. And um, I wouldn't blame the system uh, per se. But I'll give you a little bit of background on where we're coming from. The, the issue of uh, Malawi procuring IFMIS started after 2013, when we had uh, the cash get. And uh, it was uh, apparent that the old IFMIS, that one we had procured from a Tanzanian company, had a lot of uh, loopholes, and um, it was easy for officers to be able to circumvent, circumvent the system and uh, be able to siphon a lot of money out of the, the government system. So um, a decision was made that we need to procure a new system, but you know the procurement of the new IFMIS protracted too long. And uh, when we were now say we have an IFMIS uh, uh, um, um, integrated system in place, we need to now start training people then came COVID. So um, the pilot for IFMIS was only done for 10 votes. And it was for just one year. The people that were supposed to be trained were, let's say, close to 2,000 people to be trained. But maybe about 400 were trained. It's a new system. You need to train people. And people have not been trained. And the excuse that has been used is uh, COVID, uh, because the training, the, 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 the group, the, the people to be trained, the numbers were restricted under the COVID restrictions. So um, in the last financial year, a decision now was made that, uh, you know what, roll out to every single vote. Now, in those votes, there's a vote called education. Education has, I don't know how many secondary schools. I don't know how many primary schools, I don't know how many uh, TTCs that fall under Ministry of Education. 
and it's a very huge, massive vote. So if there's been a, a problem, one of which was we're now rolling out all the votes without a parallel system to allow for transition. Why did we just have to go and, um, and, and take chances with a new system? It was because nobody had confidence in the old system and everybody said, let's use this new system, it's watertight, but not all the users are familiar with it. And some of the votes are, are huge votes. So have that in mind and let's move one step forward. From the accountant general where the IFMIS resides and collects all these things from the MDS, after they have done their data funding and they want to release the money, the money must go through Reserve Bank. And then the Reserve Bank, they have got a system which is Flex, FlexTube. FlexTube is an archaic system and Reserve Bank have been trying to upgrade FlexTube. The issues as we speak are in court. And then from FlexTube, it goes on the ATS to the commercial banks. Now, what was happening before was that um, the, the, the interface between IFMIS, FlexTube and the ATS was not good enough. So the accountant general will, will, will input stuff in the, in, the, in the IFMIS and then they will transmit to the FlexTube and the FlexTube will look at some errors and push back some of the transactions. Some will go through, but the ATS, because it operates with uh, the banks, then they also have their own space as banks. So the, the accountant general, the reserve bank must operate as a commercial bank because if the banks close and there's a transaction that has uh, hit the ATS, then it must queue for the next day. So because of the so many errors that were happening, especially in the education area, you could have a lot of backlogs. Now, what we discovered was that when there are backlogs sitting at the Reserve Bank, there was no feedback mechanism back to the IFMIS at the AG's office to know what went through and what did not go through. So sitting here, the AG would say, well, we actually released these funds, probably the owners or the MDAs have received, when in fact, they have not received. And this kept on happening on a daily basis, up until the issues of IFMIS became too pronounced. And we started following up on each one of these steps so that the Reserve Bank and the, the Accountant General, they start speaking to each other as human beings. And they have now developed desk officers at each of these steps. So that if there is a, if, a, if a transaction bounces back, there should be some data reports, say back to the Accountant General, so that they can relaunch those invoices or those vouchers. So um, what I would say is that uh, the education vote, they finished doing it somewhere in September last year. And uh, they have been clearing backlogs September, October, November, even January. But um, me uh, talking to the team at the Accountant General, talking to the team at uh, the Reserve Bank, because this has been a hot issue since my coming into this ministry, I'm assured that uh, the, the human interventions which they've added has helped speed up most of the transactions and the throughput has increased tremendously. And if there's any transaction that needs to bounce back, there's a mechanism using human intervention of communicating and feeding back to each other so that they are relaunched and then processed again if there was um, any delay in the, in the process. That's where we are. It's a new system. People are learning how to do it. Um, mistakes are now becoming less pronounced than before. And the throughput has actually increased compared to before. And my hope is that uh, this progresses. And if FlexTube is finally upgraded as well, then these systems should be able to um, speak to each other much better. There's a fiber cable that has been laid now from the accountant general straight to the Reserve Bank's FlexTube. It has not started being used, but they'll start using it anytime soon. What is happening now is that from the accountant general, they are using the mass switch. They call it NITEL now. And through NITEL, they're going into the Flex tube. But they would want to move away from NITEL or mass switch and just go straight, accountant general, straight to the reserve bank, then to the commercial banks. All these 
are initiatives that are aimed at streamlining the processes and making sure that uh, we are able to process uh, these uh, uh, payments much, much uh, quicker. Uh, the PDU, Presidential Delivery Unit, that came in as um, a link between the president and the MDAs. Because in the MDAs, you've got uh, the project implementing units, PIUs. But there was a feeling that the PIUs were not moving quick enough on some of the projects. So how does the president really link with the MD, MDs? Then he came up with a presidential delivery unit. It's so much to do with what are your bottlenecks in this project or that project and how can we sit together because if we sit with you as pdu it's the president sitting with you and then things can go uh, much quicker so that's the role that the pdu uh, does and they work with every mda including minister of uh, of uh, uh, finance and uh, perhaps before i go to or maybe the 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 last one i think was so the, the other one was about scb so um, the funding for SCB was increased the last financial year, and it has been increased this financial year uh, again from about 4 billion to 6.3 billion. The funding for SCB for last year or last financial year was fully funded. And the funding for SCB in this financial year will also be fully funded. And these are the ceilings that we agree with, that uh, this is what we want, and then we, we, we agree that ceiling, and we will fund all that. But what has been happening, like everybody else has noticed, is that um, funding is one thing. Receiving the money in the account of the MDA has been another thing. For the challenges that have uh, Belabored the point between the accountant general, the reserve bank, and the ATS or the commercial banks. What we've done for the critical uh, votes like the SCB, and this I've discussed personally, even with uh, the uh, TG for Anti Corruption Bureau, that um, if there are any challenges, then the accountant general is under instruction to put SCB under the same priority as salaries because you might have noticed that uh, with all the numerous challenges of, um, uh, of um, uh, uh, IFMIS, for example, loosely termed, salaries have largely been paid on time, if you've noticed. So it's the same with IFMIS. It's just that the priority that has been given to the salaries is very high. And she's under the, the accountant general is under the same instruction that uh, they should treat some of the critical institutions, including SCB, in the same level of priority. Even if it means manually transacting those transactions so that at least uh, the, the, the amounts are received. So it's not an issue of funding. It has been an issue of processing the payments into the accounts of the MDAs. And we have uh, put in some mechanism for interventions and good collaboration between those institutions institutions and the, the accountant general's office. And I'm hoping that we shouldn't be having any challenges uh, in that regard, but the funding will be done. The allocation has been increased from 4 billion to 6.3 billion. And we're hoping that uh, all these critical institutions will be given as much assistance as possible. Can we donate like we do to health Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think uh, I, will, I would uh, leave that to to the foreign affairs colleagues. I just don't know donating goods in kind. That's I, I don't see any problem. Um, receiving computers, receiving this, unless maybe there there are some security checks. I personally don't see any problem because that's what Minister of Health does and they have got their own protocols on how to receive such. But if uh, you think of uh, money, then every penny or every coin that government receives through all its MDAs must go through the consolidated account. So that money, if people want to put some money for government, that one would be my manifest. 
before it goes to other MDAs. So that's that's a general policy. But uh, let me just maybe for one minute uh, go back to the question that was posed through Lloyd about uh, Mombera University and this road, this road, this road appearing so many uh, so many times uh, in in the budget. I would want to agree with you that some of our processes in terms of um, project implementation or actually project management are very, very slow. But you should understand that um, if you want to come up with a project in Malawi, it's a tall order. Uh, it looks much easier outside, but when you say, well, this is the project, can you make sure it happens? It's not easy. I've stayed sometimes all night just to get Malawi and South Sudan start trading. There were times people would give you phone calls in the middle of the night and say, there are about 40 trucks from Malawi with maize flour, but uh, the truck drivers are now on strike in Uganda and they can't pass through, but your flour is about to get rotten. And it's a lot of money that's involved. So if you want to see how processes go in Malawi, it's not as simple and straightforward. So for a project, you need to identify land. That's another nightmare. The compositions, that's another nightmare. The relocations. Then there's the environmental impact assessments. Then you need to have some designs. Then you need to go through the procurement of consultants and every, uh, the engineers and everything. Then you need to look for financing of the actual project. These processes will take time and you have so many roads all around. An average road for me would be about three, three years. I'm, I'm talking of a good stretch of a road, a minimum of three years to be able to go through all this process and finish. So when people see money in the budget, they're already thinking the road will start next year or this year. But perhaps they're just on the compensation side and there are so many issues, sometimes even code issues, to finish all these processes, you might be funding the project in small chunks of money, saying this year we're only funding compensation, next year we're only funding the designs, next the other year we're only funding the uh, environmental impact assessments. That's the nature of how projects are implemented here in Malawi. It's not a very ideal situation to be in, but that's where we are, that some of the projects are necessarily uh, take long and you don't want to front load the whole amount of that road in one budget when you know that this uh, project will not kick off or will not really reach this level uh, maybe until after a year uh, or so. The Kamuzu Palace was done in 13 years and that just gives you an example of uh, some projects that might take. So Mombera University maybe they have been on designs, maybe the land, maybe this. To take it up now where there are structures that would be another level and the, the, the funding now comes as at that time. So you might see it maybe in two, three consecutive years prior to seeing a big chunk that really gets the project over the line. So those are the challenges that we normally uh, find, but I'm sure every money that is allocated is subject to audits and, um, and the amounts sometimes are small. Like the Makanjira Road has been given some money and it's just for designs. And next year, people say, you also allocated money to this same road. And yes, but uh, it was for a different reason. So that's how I would put it uh, for, for, for that one. I've talked in general terms, but uh, there might be some specific projects that we can always talk about. Yes, Naomi. Okay. okay. Thank you for the response. Um, so from now on, I'm going to believe that SCB is fully funded. And that and it has always been fully funded. Just Yes, but it was very hard to believe it before because do we listen to the minister or do we listen to the to the head of SCB? You know, it was you know always the, the the head of the uh, the head of SCB has always uh, uh, confirmed that yes, they were funded, yeah. right? But it's a right. different thing to have the cash in, in their the accounts. And Thank then we have, yes. Yeah. So when she says that I had to use my own money, it's not that they are they are not funded. Like now they have got about six point three trillion, and they will be funded all of it. All right. All of it will okay. be funded, like just like last okay. year. 
but we need to find a mechanism of making sure the money is in their account. And we've got an alternative way of ensuring that that happens even if the if miss has challenges. And I've had a personal discussion even with a DG on the same, and we have an arrangement on how to proceed because they have the money. They have money. Right. All yeah. right. That is reassuring to hear. Um, you and pointed like out that. the... Okay. Okay. You pointed out the presence of Dr. Martin Mtambo, and I yes. see that he had his hand <laughs> up. I don't know if you would like to speak to us for two minutes only. Are you still with us, Dr. Mtambo? Yeah, he's back. Yes, 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 I am. Uh, well, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, honorable, thank you for giving us this opportunity and, and thanks to uh, those that organized this. I, I couldn't wait to be back here because actually I had a class today and um, <laughs> during, during my discussion today, I was talking about how individuals have impacted the United States. I think you guys know all about Amazon, how Amazon is a trillion dollar company and now Amazon actually he's rescuing the United States postal services. And then uh, you know you think about people like uh, Elon Musk. He's uh, basically challenged NASA and developed a reusable rocket. And those are individuals that are doing that thing that the government cannot do. Um, so and I think one of the things that the Honorable Minister he tabled the budget and uh, and and one of the things that I think he mentioned was how can the diaspora uh, 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 help in bridging the gap. You know, so, so to me, that's what I'm trying to think about as a diaspora team. What are some of the things that we can do, right, to help out? And, and, and obviously, um, you know, uh, thank you, Honorable Minister, for answering the questions. Uh, you used a lot of acronyms and some of those, I have no idea what you're talking about. But I appreciate it that, uh, you know, the people that ask the questions, you answered the questions as they were tabled. And uh, um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm raising a question to everybody that you, you, what are some of the things that you can do to help, help Malawi? You know, in, and I, I look at Malawi as a, a country, it's a very tiny country and the economy of Malawi is not as big as other countries. And, and I think as a diaspora team, uh, if we put our heads together and start thinking through some things, we probably could help our government, whether it's MCP in power or or in any anyone that is ruling the country, it doesn't matter. Um, and I, I think the, the last five years, what I've, I've done projects in Malawi and and tried to stay away from the government because I don't want anybody to take credit on some of the things that I work on. Uh, the, a, a big question for you, Minister, uh, uh, Honourable Minister, would be um, how much visibility do you have in uh, the funds that diaspora teams or people that are outside um, Malawi send in either through Western Union or any other route or any other means how much visibility do you have to that and could you quantify that and and is there not way that because uh, um, I look at sometimes I've sent money through Western Union and I feel like it's almost daylight robbery right? exchange rate that Western Union gives me is almost like, you know, it's unthinkable. And then my question is, how much is that actually ending up into our economy? And how much of it is actually staying here in the United States because Western Union pockets most of it. When we send the money, all of it is in US dollars. And the question is, uh, how much is that transition, you know, uh, into Malawi? Um, I've used some, some means of sending funds using an app called Wet, uh, World Remit. It had better rates, and um, in no time I found out that I couldn't use it anymore in Malawi. And then I've, I've read it back. I've reverted back to Western Union. Um, and, and 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 the other question that I'm going to ask, I just want you know, I don't know where, again if you have visibility to that because I want to know like the aggregated amount that you know when we send funds into Malawi and how much of that could, could help in any way. Um, you know, I hate to see an American company benefit more from funds that Malawians are actually sending to Malawi. And the other question that I'll ask Honorable Minister would be, um, what are the things that we'd be doing on the ground? I talked about some of the projects. The United States is funding a lot of projects, um, you know, through the, uh, the, the, the Ministry of, of, I'll call it the Ministry of Energy here, right? 
that are either individual, they fund those in order, you know, at the end of the day, when those materialize, they help the government. Like recently, one of the projects, Elon Musk, with his project team, one was partly funded by the US government. What, what is the government doing to facilitate, say, somebody in diaspora could come up with a project that at the end of the day benefits Malawi? What is the platform you're creating that will allow us to come to Malawi with the assurance that if we do this, it's going to benefit Malawi as a starting point? Thank you for, for, Thank you. for allowing me to. Now, should I proceed or? <laughs> yes, please go ahead. You know, th thanks Martin, uh, actually Professor Martin <laughs> uh, for the sentiments and the insights. Uh, thank you very much. For me, um, through you now, what I, what I really see um, as contribution from the, di the diaspora. Um, and I think that goes with uh, better links and these kind of forums are very important because we need to be able to have some formal link uh, between the diaspora network and uh, uh, those of us sitting in government positions uh, back home here. Because um, you, the investors that we receive here, most of, it, most of them, they're coming from uh, outside Malawi. And um, sorry to say, but uh, you would see that um, some of the investors that are coming here in Malawi are being introduced to Malawi government by colleagues from Zimbabwe, colleagues from Botswana, colleagues from Zambia, colleagues from Tanzania. So you know what? I got this investor for you. And then we jump on it. And then, but ordinarily, I would want to see our diaspora taking an active role in scouting for investors for Malawi, just like uh, Professor Ntambo said, and uh, would want to be introduced to all these investors from Malawian diaspora. One, it shows that you are patriotic, but we also feel comfortable knowing that this investor is coming into this country and is introduced by one of us, and uh, we, we, we sit with a lot of comfort. Uh, and that's one thing that I think the diaspora can aggressively pursue uh, and, and will try on this side to be able to create these kind of formal links. So we are able to know that these are the emails I can send this proposal to. And this is the minister that can invite me and the, the, the investor to go to Malawi and have a face-to-face -face meeting uh, so that things start rolling. The other thing which I expect personally from uh, the, like a contribution from the diaspora is um, to participate in any sort of investment back home here in Malawi. Now, there I'm talking of small investment to even bigger investments. Malawi issues, issues some bonds sometimes. Like for now, there's a local currency infrastructure bond. Um, the government of Malawi has not defaulted. We can have some debt sustainability issues, but we have not defaulted, and I don't see ourselves defaulting uh, anytime soon. Um, that should give anybody else out there some comfort that if I uh, put my money into, if you want, if you're if you're interested in medium to longer term bonds, then you know that um, you're going to recoup some uh, some 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 return from that investment sooner or later. If you want to participate in the treasury bill markets, treasury bills markets, that's like on, almost on a monthly basis. People should be able to have that confidence and say, I'm sending this money as an investment into Malawi, but you should know that that dollar that is being sent from outside Malawi is having, is having a ripple effect in the economy. It's not just your own investment, it's actually helping private sector to trade, it's helping the quarter to hold, it's helping controlling inflation. So, I would say that um, the diaspora should look at uh, financial investments, but also physical investments in the real estate uh, in, in, in any way you can, because uh, when you aggregate, um, it, it's, 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 it's a sizable investment. Um, I'm, I'm not too sure how much, and I'm not uh, ashamed to say that I'm not sure, but I've asked somebody else from the Reserve Bank to give me an exact amount of the aggregate remittances 
uh, that we get from the diaspora. If they answer me in time, I'll be able to pass a figure. Uh, if not, we can always engage maybe uh, uh, outside this fora. But what I can say, talking to the governor of the Reserve Bank, the remittances that we get from the diaspora is significant. In fact, some of the problems we're having with the DORA, the report from the governor of the Reserve Bank is that because of COVID, the remittances haven't really been flowing as they do in any financial year. And that has impacted Malawi. So it might be some small amounts, but when you aggregate, it makes a difference. And even the bank feels it that uh, the remittances have dropped. So I would expect the diaspora to be a little bit more generous with the aunties and the brothers, because the little $50 that's sent to them uh, does something. Talk less of some of the charges that the Western unions and these other uh, institutions charge, but all in all, uh, it's uh, it's it's something that um, that uh, that does help uh, as far as we're concerned. I'm not sure if um, that was all that was asked by Professor Ntambo, or if I've skipped something. But all in all, to, uh, one question I was trying to drive to: Are we able to create even a platform, an app? that will allow for 100% funds when they go to Malawi and uh, yes. um, the fees should come to Malawi. So all the diaspora should not use mm -hmm. Western Union or whatever, but use something that is Malawi generated, an yeah. app that is a Malawi app that I know that when I send funds there, if there's any funds that are gonna be left anywhere, you yeah. go into a fund that will at the end of the day benefit Malawi, not Western Union or when, not any other uh, <laughs> bank outside Malawi. Prof, that's, you're that's speaking to my to you are speaking to my heart, Prof, because uh, there's a, a UK um, uh, a colleague who came up with a motor app. Is it Moto Money? Something like that. Uh, and I was in he was here in Malawi trying to promote that app. Um, I would want to hear more of that. And would person, I would personally uh, and even lobby colleagues that we promote such uh, because local is better. And if we have apps that people are able to use and, um, and we need to take a role as those sitting in, uh, in, 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 in positions back here, we'll promote such. So um, innovation, um, any ideas that can come from the diaspora, you would want a formal channel so that it's promoted back home. I'm sure that forums like this one, some of us are very passionate about some of these things and um, homegrown solutions, apps developed by locals, they go very far. They do go very far and we would want to support such kind of local initiatives as much. Quantifying corruption, I would say that um, most of the corruption, that's my perspective, but I think the, it's a perspective that is shared by many others, comes from procurement. So um, if you really want to look at uh, the actual cost, and people can do studies for that, but um, it should be in trillions of Malawian uh, kwacha uh, as it is. It's a vice that uh, it's all well documented that um, um, it's, it's slowing everything down. Um, but specific to your question on uh, what happens to the proceeds, um, so government does have some treasury funds. Um, the Minister of Justice does have a fund that pulls and collects such kind of uh, confisc confiscated uh, resources um, by way of a fund. And um, that money is part and parcel of the consolidated account, but uh, the, the, 
the 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 ministry that holds that kind of money for now is still the ministry of justice and they've got a special uh holding account or refund uh for such kind of amounts as one of the many treasury funds that uh government does have you had another question oh, uh, cryptocurrency. Yeah. yes well, uh, the Reserve Bank, I think in their financial literacy sessions, they have also been talking highly of uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, so I think government is open to cryptocurrency. Uh, I did a, a mention earlier on when we were starting the chat uh, about uh, virtual assets that uh, we can use even our minerals as a um, virtual asset in our balance sheet as a government, and we can trade them uh, in some other um, um, stock exchanges. I know of uh, Hong Kong, for example, uh, does a lot in terms of uh, trading in virtual, uh, virtual assets. So um, we are open to it. It's uh, a new area, uh, just like mining. You need people who are experts in those areas before you jump in as a country. Uh, but if people uh, are well versed then uh, people should be able to share uh, experiences and uh, to share some papers uh, we, we, with government and see how we can benefit. But uh, from, from what I know, uh, the, 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 the government has been open, although we haven't seen much movement uh, from the public. Uh, thank you, Honorable. Uh, Lloyd, you can take over. I've been seeing Before some hands. Yeah, which hand yes, um, would you like to speak to? <laughs> no, 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 not me. But I've seen Fai uh, raising a hand like for two hours. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I was going to. I was going to invite two people actually. Um, okay. I don't know how you pronounce it, Fai, and Dr. Dali Sula Moyo. Before Lloyd takes over. Okay. Before they come on, though, there's been a suggestion that you open up your Facebook page. Maybe even if it's for one day, so that people uh -huh. can post all these yeah. questions for you to see if it is possible. Uh, so, um, okay. Is it possible that uh, we. In addition to the questions, we'll forward to your office. Yes, no, no, I, I, I hear you. Because one thing that we've not done very well as a ministry is um, uh, uh, having a vibrant Facebook um, page for the ministry. So on Monday, we want to allocate somebody special for uh, this kind of um, engagement on social media, mostly the Facebook account for the ministry. So I was right. hoping that uh, perhaps through the chair, I don't know how to do it, because mine is a personal one. All right. Okay. Yeah, so mine is a personal one, but I wanted if uh, we can patronize the 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 official facebook uh, page for the ministry and uh there's going to be additional human resource starting from monday and i'll also patronize and be able to respond some of uh these because if it goes personal it would it do it do it will not be okay. good <laughs> okay i don't know if that's I good enough but from monday we should be able to to respond to we'll, a lot of issues we'll wait for monday then um, yeah. Fai, you've got 90 seconds, and after that, Dr. Sulamoyo, you also have 90 seconds, please. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Honorable. Um, I think I'll try to summarize this very quickly. So I just wanted to ask if the Malawi government has thought of opening the development bank, which could actually uh, guarantee working capital and loans that Malawians can directly access from exit banks and other banks outside the country, uh, which can bring in uh, farming machinery or production machinery, which can also take off the burden on the government to try uh, to get all these loans if uh, private citizens are able to get them uh, through this development bank banks um, and we have quite a number of those uh, in the US in India and other countries and also is it possible that the ministry in conjunction with the, the Ministry of Trade your Ministry of Finance in conjunction with the Ministry of Trade can have information um, 
public, like in terms of the buyers that are currently there in other countries like the Middle East and Asia uh, for all these commodities so that those Malawians having, you know, diaspora Malawians having money in savings accounts could try and um, try to explore those markets uh, that are already there using other, you know, the list of um, buyers in all those other countries because the trade is already going on in those countries. And then talking of minerals, Malawi is not part of the Kimberley law. Why have we delayed? And you know that that has an impact on our mineral trading. Uh, what's our stand? Because if I, one had to find minerals in Malawi, they have to embargo them to another country that has maybe Kimberley law. Otherwise, if you export directly to countries like the US, they will not, um, GIA will not accept um, your, um, your minerals. So how are we doing, uh, how are we doing on that uh, to avoid the um, illegal export of our minerals? Um, and then uh, finally, you talked a lot about we can come and invest. Uh, I just wanted to remind you that to be mindful that we're already paying taxes on our dollars here. So if we are coming to Malawi to invest and then we are double tax, that could be a discouragement because our tax rates are very high. Is there a possibility where any Malawian investor from the diaspora coming back home to invest can actually take get a tax break for a few years? If it's already there, then that is great. But if it's not, is that something that could be considered? Thank you. Should we? <laughs> yeah, don't right. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, bye, that was? Uh, yes. For, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the, the questions. I think, um, the issue of a development bank or, or, or the development finance institutions, uh, the DFIs, has been uh, debated quite a lot. In, in fact, that's the way to go. We are using the EDF more or less like um, an, a, a, a DFI, but um, it's, 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 it can't be a fully fledged DFI. We need some development banks. We need some uh, development financial institutions uh, in the country to be a link uh, so that we promote agricultural commercialization and industrialization. I agree entirely with you on that one. Uh, the closest that the country has come to such an institution is uh, what we are calling the MIC, the Malawi um, 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 is it agricultural uh, industry industrialization kind of corporation so um, it's it's an institution that uh, is mandated to be able to give financing to just like an um, FDI I mean a DFI um, and it's being supported by donor partners as well as the Malawi government uh, the pre pretty much the it's becoming more recognized by the players in the private sector uh, apart from the EDF uh, as it is. And the, 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 the plan is uh, that uh, Mike should evolve into a fully fledged development bank or a fully fledged um, uh, uh, development finance, financing institution for Malawi private sector. So yes, uh, we are moving towards establishing, uh, establishing such, but there are also thoughts uh, of uh, coming up with an institution to model what we used to have as the MDC, if you still remember the Malawi Development Corporation. So that uh, if an investor comes and they want a, a government partner, this should be a body that coordinates all that uh, kind of uh, uh, investment. If we need joint ventures or special purpose vehicles uh, with uh, outside investors. So um, apart from uh, the development bank, uh, we also considering an, a government institution that uh, can model uh, the MDC of uh, the past days. The, the, the list of who is buying what should be able, uh, you should be able to access that information from Mike, so not from Mike, from MITC, the Mount Investment and Trade Center. They do have a portal where you should be able to get uh, as much information as possible of 
where are the uh, where is the demand for this and where is the demand for that? Um, if uh, if the portal is not properly updated, then the numbers which are on their website they should be handy for any serious person. You might not be the exporter yourself, but you might be able to identify some off takers elsewhere. And um, you can use the MITC to be able to find you the, 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 the commodities, and then you're able to link with uh, the off taker, whichever country they might actually uh, be in. So that information should be available uh, under the uh, or on the MITC website. And lastly, if we give incentives to investors that are not Malawians, definitely there should be incentives for investors that are Malawian. Um, Ethiopia has a very good model of investment for, the, for their diaspora. And uh, they are actively involved, um, even in setting up some plants, saying this one is being done by a network of um, Ethiopians in diaspora. And they contribute, they come up with a cement manufacturing company. For me, I, I, would, I would want to see, no matter how small we can start, but it's good to start and then start consolidating. Because um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a government, I think we're taking the diaspora very seriously. Let me take a, 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 a this one minute chance to update on the issue of uh, remittances. Somebody has responded, thank God. Um, before COVID, we used to have around about 250 million US dollars annually. That's a lot. But in 2020, we had 213 million US dollars remittances from the diaspora. And in 2021, we had around 214 million US dollars. The 2022 figures, we've just started the year, but we are hovering on just over 200 million per financial year remittances from, from uh, the diaspora. I don't want to put this in context, but it's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. Can you? you want me to go? Um, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Honorable. I think uh, Dalito Nsulamoyo was about to ask a question. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. I'm going to be very brief. <clears throat> First question, uh, could you please uh, update us as to the status of the economic recovery plan that was announced by the President uh, last December? Uh, what, what is the progress? Uh, what indicators could you share with us uh, in terms of the implementation, the, the implementation of that plan? The second question I have is, how does your ministry engage the various sectors of our economy, uh, inclusive of the diaspora in the formulation and development of economic policy? Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Daritz. I think the socioeconomic uh, recovery plan, you know, it, um, it dwelled on five key areas, uh, resilient and sustainable health, then resilient and sustainable education, economy and the labor market, social protection, and then an enabling macro env macroeconomic environment or macroeconomic policy environment. It's a 580 billion uh, socioeconomic recovery plan launched last year, and it goes up to uh, next year, 2023. So basically, I think, um, there are so many indicators that have been broken um, uh, down, but uh, largely it's uh, touching issues of uh, health, issues of education, issues of the economy and the like. Essentially, it's all about putting our money in those areas where we would see uh, not only cushioning of the people, but also a, a rebound uh, of, uh, of, the, of the economy. Uh, it's not only being funded by the budget, it's also being funded by our donor uh, colleagues. And um, I know with the developments in uh, Russia and Ukraine, most of the donors are now saying that tension is now slowly shifting away from ABCD. But so far, uh, if we're now talking of uh, the economy uh, in, 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 um, in 2022, uh, going to um, a 4% GDP growth, uh, that's on account of 
some of the interventions that are uh, being put or some of the resources that are being focused into the SEP. You should know that in 2020, the growth was 0 0.8. And in 2021, the growth was 3%. And we're pushing to 4% in uh, 2022. And uh, we believe that uh, all this is uh, uh, in us putting the resources into the fast growing uh, sectors uh, of the economy, according to, 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 to the SEP. But also just to say that um, uh, one of the issues in the SEP is about the, the, social, the, 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 the social safety nets, the cash transfers and everything. And uh, we've been in talks with the World Bank. Remember they used to have massive programs or food for work, as we used to call it, they had died down. But under the socioeconomic uh, recovery plan, under the banner of cushioning uh, the, the, the poor, I would say, uh, we want to bring back that program uh, in this financial year. Uh, of course, it's uh, inclined a little bit to climate change, you know, conserving the environment and the like, but it's still uh, public works. It's still uh, food for work or something like that. So um, there's going to be an upscaling of that also to cushion the people so that we can bounce back better uh, under the socioeconomic recovery plan. So uh, that's as much as I would share for now, but it's a tool that we are using to uh, push uh, the, the macroeconomic policy environment uh, much better. You asked a second question, but it has skipped my mind. It was, I don't know how. Yeah, or, it was a question regarding how does your ministry engage the ah, various sectors yes. of our economies? Yes, thank you. So it's, it's much easier engaging the various sectors of the economy uh, here in, uh, in Malawi because we do have um, the, what we call the public-private public -private dialogues. Uh, of course, it's championed by the Minister of Trade and the private sector, but the Minister of Finance forms a core part of that engagement with, uh, with the private sector. So there are meetings that happen every, every quarter uh, of the year. But uh, specifically, we'd want to see more engagement with the diaspora. So um, I know you've had engagements with the Foreign Affairs Ministry, and um, I'm happy that the High Commissioner of, um, in, in the, uh, for Malawi in the UK is on this uh, chat. Um, the starting point is you having the network as you have. And I think that's a brilliant point that there is a focal point where we can call for meetings, where we can engage government, where we can participate and feel closer to uh, um, a home, I would say, in terms of influencing policy direction and everything. I think that's a starting point. The next one would be how do we formalize and regularize some of these uh, interventions? I would say uh, through chairperson that a forum like this one at the very end, we should have a communique. We should have um, somebody else really being secretariat, taking down all these kind of uh, issues we're talking about and put it in the mainline uh, policy formulation processes of government. So it could be an engagement with the Minister of Lands. It could be an engagement with Minister of Foreign Affairs or the Reserve Bank of Malawi. But they should be, just like you have the network, there should be a way of coming up with some formal communique put it down into uh, the formal mainstream policy formulation bodies so that as we go along, we are part and parcel of this whole process because otherwise it becomes a futile event. It becomes a talk show. And I'm sure nobody can really spend as good quality time as this one. And then all these things just go to the drain. It wouldn't really make much sense. So that's how I would think of us engaging going forward, that is. Uh, thank you, Honourable. I think we're going to take uh, three more questions from uh, three people uh, and other questions. Uh, Is it possible that they ask and then I, I respond together the three questions? <laughs> uh, sure, sure, we can do that. Uh, so we'll, we'll give you one minute. So I'll start with Ruth and then Elia and Newton, you'll be the last one. Uh, please take a minute, uh, no more than a minute. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Mine is not a question or maybe a contribution half and half. Uh, thank you, Honorable Minister and all wonderful uh, people of Malawi. Uh, it's just a contribution um, for the way forward to support our nation. 
um, in the area of funding, knowing that um, we have a lot of our diaspora outside the OPC, so that we have a total number of people outside, you know, like England, America, you know, like a database. Does Malawi know how, how much population do they have outside? In that way, we can be able to do funding. We see that loads of uh, charities in the United Kingdom, as where we are, they operate under funding as small as one pound or two pounds in one port. It goes a long way and do so much work. So if that can be contributed to our, you know, Minister of Finance over the budget, which can be, you know, distributed um, in areas mm -hmm. where can be useful. Like let's say in United Kingdom, we have our diaspora. If I'm sure many people will be willing as we put our news there, you know, minimum two pounds or some who are willing, they can even add, but it's good to start it at a small amount like that so that it will be easy to do it. If somebody can do that every single month, South Africa will have their own, USA will have their own, and then there will be a central port where the money can be transferred to. As we are here, we'll transfer it to our own, you know, central um, diaspora with the, the leaders that are there, they'll have an account. It's just a suggestion um, to um, the whole house to see if that can be applicable, just to see how we can, you know, help in a large using the amount of, because for, when you have a lot of population, no matter how much you put in a cup or small, it becomes big. And if that is being put consistently every month, you know, as we are waiting for the other investment and all this, but this is funding. We see our friends, Muslim, you know, um, they use like 2% for their halal. It is being put in their central place and be distributed back to the communities. So if we can be willing to put as small as two pounds, America can put $2, South Africa can put two runs and all over the world, whether people in China, you see that there'll be such a lot of money, which they, even the, um, the nice. loan we have can go down and it can connect us to say that we are doing something for our country. Even if it's as simple as one pound or two pounds, every month it's something that cannot pinch anybody's uh, pocket. I don't know, just a suggestion. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ruth, uh, for the suggestion. Uh, I will go to Elia uh, Chimwede, if we can uh, ask or contribute. If uh, Elia is not there, I'll take Newton, Newton Maganga. Are you on Hello. mute? Yeah. Thank you, thank you for giving me the chance. Um, Your Honor, I have some question, concern on the, um, the issue of remittances. Mm -hmm. um, when we send money home, um, if it's in US dollars, I just want to find out whether the dollars are usable you know, in the economy. If I keep my money in dollars in Malawi, are they usable in the economy? It's quite discouraging on our side to send money in dollars because um, when I put my money in savings in US dollars, when I want to use it, let's say to buy, to build a house or to do whatever it is, I have to, I cannot use them in dollars. I cannot convert at the day's rate even to spend, you know, directly on my project. Um, what happens is um, I'll have the dollars in my account and then I have to apply to the reserve bank on the day that I want to use my dollars. Then the Reserve Bank tells me the rate to use to convert first into Kwacha. And then from I have to go into they have, the money has to go into my Kwacha account. And then the Kwacha account can be, you know, the Kwacha can be spent from my Kwacha account. So we are losing out. So I would rather actually keep my money this side in US dollars. And when I I think we I lost think... him, but you might have gotten the gist of the question. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Newton. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Uh, 
I read somewhere where it speaks about the World Bank has got funding to support local farmers in Malawi, more specifically in areas of poultry, uh, pork farming. Uh, however, the information says that the, the project will soon end. And the, I don't know if you are aware about this information. And the, to, uh, the, the question is, how do local Malawian farmers access the, the funds or how do they go about to make the application? Uh, the information proceeded to say that the, 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 these projects are linked with the, the agriculture and the trade ministry. And the, I'm sure you recently were serving in the trade ministry. So if you can share more about that, that would be great. I, I know of some few Malawians who are into farming and the, they're trying their level best the, the, if, to, to upgrade themselves. So let me hear from you. Uh, we, you can just finish the rest. The rest, uh, there's Dumi and Suzio. If, if those would be the last two, I don't know. Uh, sure. Uh, we'll take uh, Susio first, and uh, the last one will be Dumi. Thank you. Uh, one minute, please. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, I will be brief. I just wanted to touch on um, tourism. We have got uh, Nika and the Chikara Hills that I believe can attract a lot of people, but uh, access to them is a problem. Uh, what uh, programs do you have to pay in pipeline, long, long term or short term, uh, to do with financing of such areas? I believe the diaspora, if you had something even on your website updating people that the project requires hotels, project requires access roads, and we need to raise this amount of funds. So instead of just relying on the donors or uh, the government borrowing money from other people, I think the diaspora can contribute money together and say, okay, the government, instead of borrowing from other people, let's raise this money from the diaspora. What sort of program do you have on, the, on such accounts? Another one is mining. I think we can actually mine our own products and process and market using the diaspora. We can also raise money through that using the diaspora. What sort of programs do you have on that? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Susgo, and uh, we'll take Dumi as the last one. All right, uh, uh, thank you uh, everybody and uh, honor to the minister. I will not put up my video because I'm driving. Okay. Um, so basically the question I wanted to ask, uh, it's about uh, chamber cultivation. Um, I mean, I have interest in uh, uh, cultivating chamber in Malawi, but when I look at uh, the fees that are there, you're talking of something like $10,000, $2,000 for you to do certain things, to grow, uh, to process, to what? Those fees, I look at them, they are very, for me, they're very exorbitant and they're very high. And uh, it's, uh, it's kind of like, um, uh, uh, it's, it prevents me from moving forward to, to grow that chamber. And then I'm asking myself, if I feel like this, how about a Malawian? Will a Malawian be able to pay these fees so that uh, he or she can be able to grow a chamber? So those fees for me are very exorbitant and they prevent people from uh, moving into this chamber cultivation. So I don't know from um, your perspective, Minister, uh, is, when the fees were being set up, I don't know what criteria you had or what kind of people you wanted to, uh, to be growing uh, the chamber. When I look at it, at, at it, I just look at it like we simply want foreigners to come into our country and use our land and make money and, 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 and go and go and go out with that money. But if those fees would be maybe reduced and, and they like, I, I see myself moving into this industry and I see other people that are 
uh, that have lace, they can also move into this industry. And uh, the next thing is, um, I wanted to find out is, um, why is it not that um, Malawi government, why is it not making like aware Okay. I've lost you a little bit. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry, I had muted my mic. Oh, uh, so I was saying, so uh, on the same chamber cultivation, I was saying, uh, why can't uh, government is not doing enough to inform uh, the citizenry that there is this opportunity to be cultivating chamber, which uh, when we look here, when we read articles here, like in Chicago and other states, other cities, they make billions of dollars out of Chamba, which I see an opportunity if in Malawi, we can just raise that awareness and tell the citizenry that you can grow Chamba as much as you want. And then we put up uh, proper structures and laws, regulations, and also we, we reduce those fees, which to me are very exorbitant. Uh, we can sure uh, bring another port of income into the government. So that, that, that was my contribution and my Thank you. Thank you, Dun. Yes. Yeah, so I don't know if, you, if I, I'm still being heard. Uh, uh, yes. That was, that was the last question. Yes. Right. But I think in all, in all fairness, uh, Fai asked the question about. Um, the Kimbale law. I don't know if she's still around, but um, yes, I am. Thank you. It's something else that I might need to pick up with uh, the Minister for Mining. Um, what I've been aware of is the issue of God that uh, we need to have regulations in our country on how we do God of the mining and the export. And the, the regulations are currently being developed because without regulations, if our gold is not regulated, you cannot sell it anywhere. But the other minerals, I know that uh, the uranium and uh, the other um, uh, minerals, they are able to find some destination markets, including the rare earth or the heavy sands that are about to start uh, getting uh, exported. But um, if you can read around or Google around Malawi rubies, Excuse me. I have information that uh, Malawi rubies are really being sold in America, but uh, perhaps, like you say, it's possible that uh, there are some conduits that are being used. Yes. So sorry to. I need if it's okay. I needed to respond on that because my mm. experience, personal experience, has been that. Uh, so mm. the Tanzanians come to. Um, Neno, Sanji, that side, Neno, Mwanza, mm -hmm. that area, and get our Malawi rubies to Tanzania. They process them, they cut them, and they uh, polish them, and then they export them from there. That's mostly mm -hmm. what's happening, not directly from Malawian local traders, but actually it's being stolen from our country. So that is something that might want to be looked at. We do have a lot of people from Tanzania taking our you know, minerals in those trucks. Wow. I think that's something else that needs to be uh, followed up and looked at because the case I was aware of, and that's the one that uh, the, the Attorney General and uh, a few other people are trying to get support uh, from uh, other renowned lawyers to help us because there's a platform in one of the precious metal commodity markets uh, in, in the US. I don't know whether it's Chicago or a different state, where when you pull the information, it shows that uh, Malawi rubies so, so much dollars. And if you go down the years, it's a lot of money. When you go to our own MRA system and you find that uh, only $300 million or maybe $100 million. And the other side, they are talking of little, little money. And that's where the puzzle is, saying the registry somewhere in America shows that these have been the exports for Marawi rubies. 
and the amount is like 100 times more than what we have locally here. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. So those that are in the know of how these precious metals are moving, I think let's keep engaging because um, apart from smuggling of our metals, there could also be something else going on. And um, if it's being registered in the US that this is from Malawi, then there's a big question that needs to be answered because we need those dollars back home. So thanks for flagging that one up. Um, it's an issue that we need to continue engaging and see how best um, we can safeguard our own minerals and make the benefits a maximum benefit out of them. But very quickly, I think uh, Ruth had an issue of the database. Um, I think the Foreign Affairs Ministry should have um, uh, a semblance of some sort of database. Of course, their complaint is people arrive in countries and they don't care registering with their nearest embassy. So, but that's something else that we can work out. It's very important that embassies really know who is in their country. And beyond that, embassies need to share information so that we have the whole diaspora network uh, registry. Two, three days ago, I had a virtual meeting with MasterCard Foundation. And um, it's a big charitable organization doing quite a lot for young people and the like. I had wished, sorry to say, but um, the team that I was uh, exchanging um, or I was, I was having a meeting with is an African team. And they do have some local, I would say NGOs working with them to help Malawians. All I'm driving at is we should be able to uh, uh, be able to like 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 the, the idea is being put forward. Be able to talk to some of these foundations and um, be representatives of such foundations, even if it's a local NGO here in Malawi. But there can be some space for um, the diaspora to be able to court some of these um, 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 funds. Uh, like the MasterCard uh, uh, fund uh, through Malawians in diaspora. So um, whether they're charitable organizations in Chicago or in uh, Dubai or in South Africa, and we are able to talk to, let's do that. I don't really see um, what would call direct budget support. I would see as a starting point, money that can be raised and he help those that are affected by floods in Salima or floods in Chikwawa and Sanji. Um, and say, you know what, the diaspora network, and if it's well coordinated, you would send representatives to come and give relief aid or relief maize as a donation. And that will relieve government from doing the same to the same constituents or the same people. And that money would be channeled towards something else more, product, uh, uh, more productive. Um, that's the quickest way uh, of the meaningful contribution that can come uh, from uh, the diaspora if you, you, you're able to fundraise uh, for this or that cause. To have it channeled into the budget, the only implications are issues of due diligence, issues of this. There's so much now that comes up uh, when you're looking at a port that goes directly into the national budget in terms of source of money and everything else. So um, for me, the quickest and easiest is the diaspora being able to look at what is the current need in Malawi and how can we come in and help that specific need. And that will relieve government from that same uh, uh, burden. So um, uh, that's how I would look at uh, issues suggest uh, Rufi's suggestions uh, as I welcome those suggestions. The issue of uh, foreign denominated, sorry, foreign currency denominated account. So you can open an account in Malawi and, uh, and it's an FCDA. So the law currently is that um, out of your 100% uh, remittance into your uh, foreign currency denominated account, you must liquidate 30%. And that's only as a temporary measure because of the forex situation. Otherwise, you are allowed to keep 100% of your foreign currency denominated account. So you'll be keeping 70% for now. When the situation stabilizes, people should be able to keep 100% of their dollar money. 
And when you want to liquidate it, chances are that uh, with the weakening quarter, you should be able to gain rather than lose. In fact, people want to keep dollars rather than the Malawi quarter at a time like this one. It's only when the quarter is appreciating that you might want to liquidate as quickly as possible. But what is obtaining now is people want to hold on to the dollar as long as possible because of the current macroeconomic uh, circumstances that we're in. And um, the World Bank does have two main programs which they are running. There's the financial inclusion and entrepreneurship um, program, they call it Finesse. So that one, they are lending money to uh, farmers, young people, and they're lending them at, let's say, no more than 11% interest because it's a World Bank money. Malawi borrowing from World Bank at maybe 1% or 2%. And then when they add some costs, we are now passing it on to some participating banks like NBS, Standard Bank, and I think a few more other banks and some other microfinance institutions. And we are asking them to put a premium, but the rate they are using should not go beyond 11%. And it's only to the farmers and the young people, the SMEs. So that facility is available. But the one that people are also talking more about is the agricultural commercialization, AGCOM. So that's another fund. It's a government loan, concession loan from the World Bank, but it's also targeting uh, a, lo uh, a lot of farmers. They, it's like a matching grant. So they bring in 30%. It doesn't have to be money. It can be any sort of contribution. And um, this program is ending next year. It was a $95 million uh, uh, program. But already we have started negotiations with the World Bank and they're also satisfied given the performance of uh, that program that we need to upscale it even three times more than, a, than the $95 million which is expiring. So the signs are that program will be rolled over for another three years and amounts should be doubled or tripled in the new program because it has performed very well and many farmers have benefited. So. Um, those are the two programs that uh, the farmers are benefiting from the World Bank uh, uh, loan. Lastly, Suzio. No, no, not lastly. Suzio came in with issues of uh, tourism. I agree entirely with you. The plan is we want to be thinking of um, lake cities. And I know there's one local investor that has already started some movement in Cape Maclea trying to come up with that concept. And I also know that um, another local promoter is also promoting the same uh, part of the, of the lake near Cape Makili. So the idea is somebody builds a hotel, another person uh, builds a shopping mall, another person builds a university, uh, until the whole, another, another person does the airstrip, until the whole thing is like a lake city. And that's where the diaspora would say, well, will be able to do a hotel as an investment from a group of diaspora, um, uh, from those kind of concepts. That's where our tourism is going. I've received uh, a notification from an investor who wants to do an airport city, and he says it's gonna be a green city, targeting our Lilongwe International Airport. And he's doing that, he wants to do that in conjunction with the ADL. But the ADL is the vast land near that little airport. But they have a concept which can revolutionize the whole uh, Lilongo International Airport into a lake city where people would come from town, go to the, uh, to the airport because there are casinos, there's entertainment, and the place is vibrant as a city. So we'd want, just like you have uh, Oxford city or town built around Oxford, we'd want to have that kind of concept where we are like airport cities or lake cities. If our universities were big enough, we'd also be thinking of university cities. But uh, for now, these are the two concepts going forward as far as tourism is concerned. And access to those areas is a priority. And we're already doing uh, part of that in, uh, in, even in the budgets. And lastly, Dune came up the issue of cannabis. And I think that's where I'll be ending it at. Um, when, when the fees came, there was an uproar. And some of us took interest to find out uh, from the Cannabis Regulatory Authority saying, why 10,000? What informs this decision? 
passe rationale. And uh, the response that we get is that um, the, the, the cannabis, the, the, the medicinal hemp, or the cannabis, uh, I don't know how, they, how else they call it, but um, they say it's a specialized crop and uh, without special training and special way of handling the crop, you cannot do it. So you have the cannabis regulator, so the cannabis association of the USA, they are here with a team training people on how to grow this cannabis. And I'm told if you don't do it right, like there's a certain cooperative in Inchinji, they invested and the whole thing has turned black and it's really like waste. And uh, the Cannabis Association will say, no, we went to train them, but uh, they thought we were just trying to rip them off or take advantage of them, but look at what has happened. Now they are recreating. So they have been arguing that uh, the, the 10,000 is because it's a specialized crop and I do only need... Um, uh, people who are who have the technical know-how and the expertise to be able to do it. It's not for every person to do it up until people have known how to do it. But for now, people would come in not ready and not be able to reap the benefits from the cannabis. That's what we're getting now, but that doesn't take away the fact that the fees remain exorbitant and the way it needs to be found to be able to make it um, uh, more affordable for locals. But uh, the, the argument to the same is that um, why don't we change the laws so that the Nkota Kota cannabis, because the demand for the Nkota Kota cannabis is even more for countries that have um, recreational cannabis uh, uh, allowed. And the demand is huge. So the debate has started. Uh, even the, uh, the attorney general knows of the issue and is also trying to look at the kind of laws because it touches on some laws on drugs, the local laws. We need to change some of our local laws so that the seed for the Nkota Kota cannabis, but also the leaf can find its way into a legal market elsewhere. And the demand for that is also huge. That is easier to cultivate. Any Malawian can do it. And perhaps um, it's a debate that uh, needs to be um, encouraged rather than uh, muted. Uh, going forward as far as cannabis is concerned. And overall, any increase in exports will help our balance of payment and will help our economy move forward. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Your Honorable. Um, to the entire audience, we are 37 minutes beyond the slot that uh, we had blocked <laughs> for the minister. And uh, yeah, we just I have to acknowledge his uh, generosity to keep going on and on, but uh, I think it's time we, we resume. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the discussion that we had. I know um, we can keep on and on now because questions have continued coming here, but uh, everything at some point has to come to an end. But I uh, just assure all of you who uh, have put up questions here that have not been attended to each and every question that is here we will reach the minister. That has been the practice all along in uh, these sessions here. After we are done here, we get into the chat and um, we pull out all the questions, whether they've already been attended to, and um, I mean, or they, you know, they've not. We compile them into a document and we send them to the minister. They look at them and they get back to us with the feedback and then we compile a final report, which we post on our website. Um, as we said earlier on, yes, yeah, the audience here is uh, from uh, all sectors, but then uh, the host here is uh, MCPDN. And uh, if you want to give us any follow-up feedback, uh, you can get on our website, which is uh, diaspora mcp.com. Uh, I think I would request the chair to just uh, post the website on the chat here. You can um, uh, take note of that. And uh, if you've got any follow-up comment to make, you can just do it on that. But again, once we are done with uh, the entire report, including the one for the Minister of Lands that we had uh, two weeks back, you will find all that resource on um, the website there. And again, for our future engagements, all the details will be on that forum as well. 
uh, as we conclude, not sure if um, um, the honorable might have some closing remarks. And after you do that, I will pass on to our SG, who is uh, Mr. Mpatso Mainara, to uh, give the winding remarks. And then uh, finally, I will request our sister Sitembiri to close with a prayer. So yeah, um, the minister, if you can give the final remarks and then um, the SG will close before we get into the prayer. Otherwise, thank you so much to all of you for sparing your time. We've been here for two hours now. That's um, quite long to most of you, but um, we honor your availability here. But uh, more importantly, again, for adhering to the protocols that we had and uh, apologies, we couldn't take all the questions. Yeah, we have people like um, um, Junaid who have been raising hands here, but uh, we couldn't accommodate everybody. But uh, as I said, all the questions will reach the minister and the answers will come back to all of us. Thank you so much. In that order, uh, the minister, if you could close and then uh, the SG and then uh, sit with a prayer. Thank you. Now, oh, Lloyd, just to thank each and everyone for the passion and the patriotism. I think if we need to, if we will have to turn around this country, it will be because of uh, such kind of passion and such kind of patriotism. And I can only hope that this spirit lives on until we see a new Malawi. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. SG. Thank you. Um, Hatsu Mainala, if you are here with us. Uh, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Minister, we are privileged uh, that we had uh, you engaging with us today. On behalf of all, it is my pleasure to extend our gratitude for this uh, occasion. Today, you have given us uh, the opportunity to hear what uh, your ministry is doing in saving Malawians. Not only did uh, we hear from you, but you also gave us the opportunity to present our views and suggestions to your honorable minister, who also happens to be one of the key policy makers. Uh, you have given us the guidance on how and where we can contribute more with confidence, but also we have heard from the horse's mouth being the Minister of Finance and Economic Planning, one of the key policymakers in this uh, uh, fight uh, to, for the betterment of our nation. Furthermore, it is a pleasure that we were able to get timely responses from you, Honorable Minister. This, key, this is key to our contributions from the diaspora. It is helpful for those who wish to, uh, in the diaspora, to, to, to contribute to Malawi. It helps us to shape our plans in the next financial year, in this year. Your Honorable Minister, in this global village we are living today, Malawians, we cannot be left behind. Us in the diaspora, indeed, we have a role to play in connecting Malawi to the outside world. Uh, more to the, skill pool, to the skills pool, financial remittances, capital investments, machinery, travel, and indeed, as you mentioned, uh, tourism, uh, to mention a few. But we remain to be untapped resource that is ready to be deployed. To deploy. As such, it is our hope, as also mentioned, uh, example being the remittances, that uh, your ministry will continue to remove the bottlenecks that are hindering Malawians and investors from abroad to invest in Malawi. Uh, having said that, your honorable minister, the biggest foreign investor for many developing nations remains to be their citizens living in diaspora. I stand to be corrected. Just to highlight on this point, uh, uh, according to the World Bank, Nigeria receives an average of $17 billion a year in remittances from the diaspora. So Malawi as a country needs uh, to find ways of motivating its diaspora to remit through official means, hence contributing to the foreign currency reserves, as well as uh, boosting the economy. Your Honorable Minister, 
we are together with our government in the fight against corruption. We take note that fact that uh, the fight against corruption has intensified. Surely we as Malawians shall become victorious if we remain resolute to on, on, on this. Uh, the bottle is either half full or half empty. It depends on one's perspective. Honorable Minister, with these few remarks, we wish we had more time, as already said, and exhaust all that we had prepared at this point. However, we hope this is just the start of many engagements to come with your Honorable Minister. We would like also to extend our pleasure to His Excellency, the State President, Dr. Lazarus McCarthy Chakwera, for allowing this occasion to involve us in the diaspora. And also we acknowledge the presence of our Director of International Affairs, the High Commissioner to United Kingdom, His Excellency, Dr. Thomas Bisika. Your Honorable Minister, we wish you the very best and success in your ministry. Friends and colleagues, thank you all once again for being part of this noble cause. We at MCPDN, we remain committed in facilitating such meetings, bringing you closer to home at the heart of government, connecting Malawians across the globe with key policymakers and key stakeholders. Please take note, you may wish to join us at MCPDN Network by emailing us at, as already pointed out, but I'll just repeat it, MCPD Network or visit also our website at diasporamcp.com. If not, you may just wish to drop your email so that you can be added to our mailing list. With these remarks, thank you all. May God richly bless you and thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Sitembire. Close with a prayer. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the time that you gave us to gather together and share this important information about our country. We know that you started with us and everything that has happened, it is because of your guidance, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we know and realize that it is you alone who can give us the grace and the wisdom and the means to transform the economy of our country, Malawi. May you give us the strength and the guidance that we need, because we know that on our own, we cannot do this. But with your guidance, Father, we know that everything is possible. I just want, Father, to ask for a blessing for each and everyone who was able to attend this meeting. Bless us all, Father, as we look forward for another meeting so that we can continue, Father, discussing important information about our country. In Jesus' mighty name, I have prayed. Amen. 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 I guess that's bye bye. Amen. Yes, it is. Yeah. Thank you so much once again. You have a good night. Thank you. And uh, enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. 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 Bye. Bye. Ponga. What? Yeah. Come.